The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Shoreline Safety Institute's HAZMAT Series Part 8 Hazardous Materials and NARS or Non-Accidental Releases Guidelines for Rail Car Inspection. My name is Michelle Malski and I am the Safety Program Manager here at the Shoreline Safety Institute. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind all of our guests and presenters to please mute or silence your phones during this presentation. This presentation will be recorded and we will make this recording available to all participants. If you missed something or would like to watch this webinar again, you may go back and review this webinar on our website, www.shortlinesafety.org, under the Webinars tab on the home menu. To ensure quality audio for this recording, we have placed all of the attendees on mute at this time. You will only be able to hear our presenters speaking. If you have any questions during this presentation, you may use the questions bar on your screen to type in your inquiries. We will dedicate time at the end of this presentation to read through all submitted questions at the end and provide time for our presenters to answer. Now for today's webinar, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Jeffrey Moore here with us in DC from the FRA. His title is Safety and Hazardous Material Specialist. And joining him is Lawrence Mel Mazzaro from the FRA, Safety and Hazardous Materials Specialist as well. The team is on the line with me here now, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Moore to get us started. Mr. Moore, the show is yours. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, would like to get you started here, so we're going to go through the presentation and start on these uh, slides. So basically today for us, we're going to just talk about today's topics in a quick overview. We're going to discuss the hazmat authority and goal that we have, review some responsibilities for conducting a ground level inspection of any car containing a hazardous material, and review the non-accident releases. Now, one thing you get to keep in mind is the Hazmat Authority, just to give you some background, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safe, uh, Safety Administration, or we call FEMSA for the acronym, they're the operating administration for pushing the hazardous materials regulations. The FRA is the administrating, uh, operating administration that actually enforces those regulations for rail. Now, for the Hazmat Division goal for us at FRA, our, our whole goal was based upon a few things, but basically we're here to manage the risk inherent to transportation by rail. Achieving the goal is what you see on these bullets below. It's basic. We want to give education, we do our inspections, and we do system assessments, which is a big part of seeing how we're formulating and getting to these points. And then, unfortunately, we do have our enforcement tools if, if, as needed if, if that comes out. Now, the HAZMAT staffing in Washington, D.C., this is kind of gives you a breakdown. The headquarters staff, we have a single staff director. We have six HAZMAT specialists. Now, for those of you who don't know, a QA specialist is a quality assurance specialist. They're our tank car folks. They're the ones that actually look at the, the construction, the basics, and a lot of the QA points for a lot of tank car shop inspections. And the, to support all of us, we have package engineers. We have two of those currently at this point. Now, what you folks may see in the field are regional inspections, or inspectors. We have a, a regional specialist, uh, a supervisor in charge of various amounts of inspectors around the country at different points. And we have hazardous materials inspectors. We have 63 of those. And they have some state uh, supporting staff uh, at various points. Not every state is participating, but we do have quite a, quite a lot. This is a great point for us. We wanted to get into this kind of a nuts and bolts move. What inspections are required by trained service employees? And this is a big part of just a ground level for all of us. But first, we wanted to go over this. The basic definition of a train. A lot of you have heard this. One or more locomotives coupled together, except during operations that involve switching. Now keep that in mind, except during operations that involve switching. It'll play out here in a moment. Now you meet the definition of a train under the following conditions. For us, for hazmat, when the air brake rules apply and or when interchange involves a chain of custody with cars, transfer movements, or even when the air brake rules don't apply, you're not considered switching and you will be required to comply with the hazardous materials regulations for train movements. And basically what that means is understand that if you meet the definition all parts of the regulations are in effect. And what that comes down to is your expectation, you're supposed to have your paperwork in order, you're supposed to have a document telling me what's in those cars in your train and where are they. Keeping in mind, this doesn't apply to distances and it doesn't apply to yard limits. If you have the air brake rule applies or you're doing transfer movements or interchange movements, this is going to come apply. Hazmat train documents. Now one thing to keep in mind, this sounds very simple. We're looking for a readable document. Make sure the basic information is there. And does my document or my documents match the car or cars that I'm picking up at, at these points? Now keep it in mind, we're going to go over this again. Basic information on a hazmat document. You enter NAID number. 
when you look at a placard, that's the number right in the center of the placard for most parts. It comes about most different ways, but that's pretty much a guess. We're looking for the proper shipping name, the hazard class. Packing groups, you'll see those on the documents, PGs, 1s, 2s, and 3s. Well, that doesn't work for our gases like our LP gases and things of that. Reportable quantities come about, and they're not always applicable, but they do in some instances, and this is an absolute. We always must have an emergency response telephone number. Now, notice the train crew placard of cars. This comes out a lot. The train crew's got to have a document that tells us where these truck cars are in their train. In addition, they have got to have a copy of a document showing what is in each of the rail cars or and or tank cars that are in your train. So basically, keep in mind, you've got to know where you are and what's in each car in your train at all times. Now, readable versus unreadable. This sounds a little bit simple, but you'd be surprised how many times we find this. Train concepts or shipping papers faded. A lot of times when you operate paperwork off of a printer, sometimes you get a lot of bad print. Other times it just doesn't seem to line up well. You've got to make sure you can read it. Now, relieving train crews on the road. Now, a lot of times we don't do this in great daylight hours, but you've got to understand manual updates have to be readable. So whoever you're relieving, make sure you can read what they've put down and understand bad penmanship is not always acceptable. And we also had bad math issues. Some guys just, it doesn't work out when they can't add and they pick up and set off cars. We've had issues of that. Water damage, well, we all, all don't work inside. So sometimes when they carry their documents, they do get damaged through water. Just make sure they're readable. We pick these up in the knuckle a lot of times on interchanges. So make sure you can obviously read your documents before you take these cars. And again, don't accept the hazmat unless you can read the documents that you're going to pick up. Now, Operating local trains and industry pickups. These are very important because you are the first line of inspection. So understand, ground level inspections mean a lot. Now, you're looking for leaks here. Examples, we're going to show you some stuff on here. Product running down the sides of the tank. Seeping or dripping. Product seeping around the bottom outlet valve. These are ground level inspections you've got to be careful of. And you can sell, tell this obviously in great daylight hours. This is a caustic soda car. Leak down the side of a car. This is another, this is, I believe, an acid car at this point, or a crude oil car. Leaks down the side of the car. Very clear, very visible from ground level, and as you can see, nothing on either side. You've got to be conscious and look out for these. This is on top of a car, but as you can tell to the left picture, that's product, liquid product running down the sides of the car. And the right side picture, understand, that's a bottom outlet valve. You've got to look at the plugs. You can see corrosion and product around that. Be conscious of this and honestly just look for these things, these are leak points. We're going to talk to you a little bit about NARS. Now, non-accident releases, when you find this type of thing, what, it, what are we supposed to do? Now, you've got to understand, as soon as you notice this or within 12 hours of any incident, you've got to report this to the National Response Center. This phone number, as you can see here, 1-800-424-8802 or the 202 number, 267-2675. These are numbers that are posted in the regulations, but they're always great to have. These things come about a lot, but these are really quick. You've got to do these within 12 hours. This is one of the basic requirements they need. Name of the reporter and just a few some basics. Where are you? Where is the incident? Date, time, if there's any injuries, it's a great thing. And any hazmat information, as you can see in 6, we've got to have that reported as much as information as we possibly can. And any type of incident, that's specific to if it's a non-accident release, if it's a derailment, a result of anything other than uh, what we would know. Um, also, big point here, reportable incidents come about, and this all would follow through with additional information. We have anything, a person may be killed, injuries, general public evacuation, major transportation artery. We've got look more severe issues here. Now, again, we add more and more stuff here, but when you get into, as you can see, the detail comes in, and you get into radioactive materials. Don't happen really often, or very rarely, if any, but these things can come up. Fire breakage, spillage, or contamination of an inspect, infectious substance. Not a big rail point, but it's something we have to be conscious of. And a release of a marine pollutant. And they are those over waterway issues. They come about pretty often. And when you get into one more, we've got a situation of uh, what we call danger to life. This is an issue where it can be in a, in a compromising place and may have to be moved on to something else. And then we have an aircraft clause in here that we'll just go through really quick, but that's basically aircraft, violent rupture, and some other issues. These are written reports that are required. Now, this is going to get into something for most of you somewhat quickly, but a written report, each person making the report must also make a report under this statute. You, you guys may understand this as what we call a 5800 report. 
I'll show you what that means in just a moment, but these are some basic points. Any person in physical possession of a hazmat at the time of the incident must submit the hazmat report, 50, DOT 5800, and I'm going to show you a picture. This is found on PHMSA's website. This is the greatest guidance tool we have for filling this out. It's a four-page document. It's not an intimidating document. A lot of these can be filled out online. Their drop-down menus can give you a lot of brownie points on how to put these things together. They're pretty quick and pretty easy. And if you have any issues, most of the time we can give you some numbers and find those things out and get you corrected. Leaks. We're back to this again. Just want to show you guys some points of some confusion that has come about. And these are great points to show you. Bottom outlet plugs. Now, at a ground level inspection, when you see these, you may have some conscious efforts to stop. What we want you to understand is to make sure you stop, you don't move the car, you call somebody, inform them of what you're looking at. As you can see, both left and right photos are pretty much the same thing. Now, local pickups, you know, these things come about a lot, but the biggest thing you want to look at is commodity stencils. These are very important. They're required on certain, we call liquefied petroleum gases, or what we call 2.1 gases. Inhalation hazard, that's our chlorines a lot of times. Legible car stencils. When you look at a car from long, up from the side, from left to right, that is on the right side of the car. It gives you a lot of these test dates. We're going to give you an idea what this means and what, what you need to be looking for to make sure we don't get in any trouble. Placards, readable, not faded or torn or missing, or as we can say later on, I'll say misconstrued. Now, up to this photo, it's got about four different uh, elements it's trying to tell us here. Anhydrous ammonia, liquefied, what we've got here is one stamp over another stamp when the car changed commodities. This is pretty much a big mess. We've got to make sure situations like this don't get moved. This is a, a, a combination of various things, but these are very, very confusing things to a responder. This is what we've got to be conscious of. Now, when you get to a new year, January rolling over from December, we get into a lot of points. We want to make sure the test dates on these cars. As you can tell in the left picture, these test dates from last year into this year. They're very readable, very clear. This is a big, big point. But you've got to be conscious of the fact of expiring dates. And I'll show you something in the next photo. Take a look at this. We notice in 2016 we'll see it, as we can see today. But let's just say it's January 5th or even today. We're February 28th, 2017. Could this car be okay to be accepted in interchange? These are points you've got to watch and make sure you don't move until you really take a focus effort and call someone. Now, readable tank car test dates. As you can tell by that photo, something has happened to the test date qualification stencil in the car. It's been torn for some reason. Uh, we don't know. Couldn't validate why or where it occurred. All we know is we found it. Now we're not supposed to move it. None of that is valid. And as you can tell by the placards on the bottom, it looks like it's been some sort of an incident. Now what we're going to do here is talk about rail car numbers and placards and IDs. We're going to get into the ID number of a shipping paper and show you when you hold a shipping paper how you look at a car and identify do I or do not have the right car by the document that I have. And you can tell the ID, the proper shipping name, the class, these points are here. Now for a lot of you, this is a railroad way bill. Now they pretty much stick to a similar format, but what I've done to the left is blown up the description itself. I wanted to just point out some things here. The residue last contained 2582 ferric chloride. This is a pretty standard setup. No issues here at this point. What we're going to get into is I'm going to show you. You're holding this way bill, now we're going to go to the car. Now first, what we're going to do is the UNID, as you can see the descriptions on the lower half below, below the circle, residue last contained, the 2582 is highlighted. That is your UNID number. Now you're looking at your way bill and your car. You're making sure those two match up. That's your first connection to make sure, okay, it looks like I may have the right document for the right car. Now next, as you can tell, the class number. The class number is on the lower in the corner. This is, this is the class number for the hazmat. We're comparing our document again to the placard. Now we've got two points on this thing. We should be in pretty good shape. As you can tell, here's just a quick review. Class numbers are on the bottom. The ID numbers are in the center. These are things that you've got to be conscious of where they are on your placard on your basic uh, hazmat documents. We don't know what happened here. This is one of those things when car inspectors or someone who's not educated on replacing placards does something. They inverted the placard into the holder, but yet they put the ID numbers incorrectly. Okay, on correctly. So we have a mixed match of a lot of information here. So as you can tell, these are one of these points you've got to be conscious of and looking for. You've got to understand your orientation of your placard. Now, big thing here, always work at your pace. Do not be in a hurry. Complete your inspections. Take time to update your paperwork. Remember, you're going to hand this paperwork off potentially to somebody else to read. And at most of all, remember this, if your air brake rules apply on your train, you must have all your required documents. 
don't accept a car or assume responsibility of anything outside of its destination without taking the steps to properly check the paperwork, the cars, and the tanks. All of them go together. Ultimately, now, you're responsible for the quality and accuracy of the paperwork. The accuracy of your trained documents can help save lives in a hazmat emergency. Now, remember, you've got resources. Understand, you've got your own rule books, you've got the CFR, you've got the emergency response guidebook, and there's some placard tables or charts available to you. Just keep in mind, there are resources available. Take your time. Don't be in a hurry. And that would conclude to this now. If you have any questions, please feel free. All right, at this time, we'll start to take some questions live. The first question that we do have that's coming in now, um, one of our participants would like to know if, may I use some of these images in our training for our TYNE and managers? It's absolutely acceptable. That's fine. Okay. All right. Um, one more here. Now you displayed a picture of a date on a tank car for 2016. The question is, how do I know if I can accept it or not if it's 2017? Great question. What you've got to understand is, even in 2017, if we see a 2016 car, the issue is, was it loaded and offered in 2016? It would make it acceptable to receive in 2017. That's one thing you've got to remember from the regulations. Just because a date shows prior, the last year prior doesn't mean it's not acceptable at this time. Okay. And we're lucky because we just discussed this for an hour and a half this morning with the headquarters staff. Uh, and the key there is that it was offered prior to the end of the year. Right. You have to have Not both just pieces. loaded, but offered. Right. You have to meet both pieces of criteria, loaded and offered before it runs out. All right. One other question. What do you do if a stencils are out of order or does have the wrong dates on the side of the tank car or other car? The question is, what, what do you do? What would, a, what would an employee do if they're at an interchange point or they're receiving a car from an industry? You have to report it. If you have the availability to report it and document what's going on with the car uh, to the best of your ability. And then if you cannot, if you can consciously not take the car at that time, that's understandable. If there's a situation where you cannot, make sure you mark it, you push it off at the next location where you can and report it maybe to a supervisor and they may tag it as a bad order or some other reason not to move further. If possible not to take it, do not take it until it's clear, uh, cleared up. Because you you got to get hold of the shipper, make sure everything matches in that car, the right placarding, because if there is a derailment or an accident, an emergency responder comes, they're going to be confused. What is it? If you don't have to take it, don't take it. If you do take it, you're going to be liable. So remember that. Get the right information before you pull the car. Okay. Another question here. Can a railroad use information from a tablet M crew to show their consist of a train including placarded cars? Right now, the, the, docu the, the documents required by our crew are, are intended to be manual documents. Where electronics are not accepted. Some of the class ones at this point are using electronics, but that cannot be their mainstay source. And the reason for it is reliability and durability. Both one is, is if you get into a situation where Wi-Fi's aren't available, the tablet may or may not hold up. You may lose your information and you have no backup. The other is durability. If you drop the tablet, break the tablet, or some other way where it increases or compromises your information, you have no backup. Right now, it has to be a document, a paper document generated at this time. They're working on potentially changing that in the near future, but they've got to prove both reliability and durability at this point. So there's some tests that are coming up in the near future for something like that. We're, we're just going over this issue now with an RSAC with all of industry. And, there, and the regulation as it reads in the CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, is a document. A document means a piece of paper. We all are we are going to go to an electronic form, and but we're not quite there yet. So yes, you must have a paper document. All right. Uh, one of the last questions we have here, it looks like, um, and I'll let those participants that are on the line keep filtering in some questions if you have them. But um, in the meantime, one of the questions commonly asked here is, um, is this material going to be made available to all those that participated today? And I can answer that question, which is yes. We will be recording this session and the 
presentation itself will be made available in a PDF format available on our website. Is there any additional information that you guys would like to add to our presentation today? If you have any questions, and that's will always arise after we finish this webinar, please feel free to contact either Jeff or I, and, and we'll do our best to get back to you with, a, with an answer you can rely on. Yeah, our emails are available up like on the last slide currently viewed right now. Okay. One last question we, we do have. Uh, will there be more NARS presentations coming available? Yes, they'll be coming. Excellent. All right, well, that is all the questions that we have for today. If anybody thinks of any ad additional questions, like Mel had mentioned before, we'd like to discuss this directly with any of our presenters or here at the Shortline Institute, you may contact them or myself directly. Our contacts provide on the final screen. Now, if you'd like to prov provide any feedback or suggest further topics for webinar presentations, please feel free to contact me or Sabrina Weiss, VP of Education at the ASLRA directly. Uh, our contact information is also listed right there on the screen. Now stay tuned with us for the next webinar in March. We'll have two more coming up, and we'll get more information to you very shortly. Thank you all for joining us, and have a safe day.